So first of all, I would like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank the Iowa City Public Library for giving us this space and the technical backup and the live stream for those of you at home today. Welcome to the Friday panel series of the International Writing Program's Fall Residency. For those of you who are new to our programming, we've given our writers a topic to consider and present to you today. Copies of these presses will be available next week on our website at iwp.uiowa.edu, where you can also find biographies and writing samples from our writers and a schedule of our upcoming events. You can also find this information by scanning a QR code on bookmarks that are available at many of our events. Additionally, we'd like to thank Russ Gannum for our pizza at the back of the room for those of you attending in person. And again, welcome to today's reading. Today's panel discussion is titled, Must a Migrant Be Grateful? And Robert Frost, The Death of the Hired Man, is the memorable definition. Home is that place when you have to go there. They have to take you in. His interlocutor adjusts, I should have called it, something you somehow haven't to deserve. Who has the right to cross a border? Who has the obligation to open the door? Must the one crossing the threshold take off their shoes and bare their head? Must she or he deserve? And how to think about this dialectic of yearning and rights, of mercy and obligation, when a fault line must le much less tangible than a national border hovers above us all, namely the latitude at which heat and drought make living conditions impossible. What will become of the expectation that someone, someplace, has taken you in, and that this is something one needn't deserve when political lines drawn around land become meaningless? First, I'd like to introduce Arturo Domoslavski. He is a Polish nonfiction writer and journalist, fluent in Spanish and Portuguese. He has spent a large part of his career in and writing about Latin America. In addition to his writing about Polish co contemporary history and politics, his works include Latin American Fever, Death in the Amazon, and The Outcasts. He is the author of two biographies, Richard Kapuscinski, a Life and the Exile, 21 Scenes from the Life of Zygmunt Bauman. The former won Domoslavsky the Grand Press Award of Journalist of the Year in 2010 and was published in English by Verso in 2012. In addition to publication in seven other languages, the latter book, which details the life and work of Polish Jewish philosopher, sociologist, and public intellectual Zygmunt Bauman, won the Silesian Literary Award Julius for Best Biography in 2022 and was shortlisted for the NIKE Award the same year. He was awarded the Knight Fellowship for a sabbatical year at Stanford University from 2005 to 2006. Next to him, we have Mr. Ladaki Guru Tishering Ladaki, born in Gangtok, a small capital of the former Himalayan kingdom. Sakim, poet and writer, Mr. Ladaki received his bachelor's degree in commerce with, honor, with honors from Del Delhi University, but he would have been happier studying literature. His first collection of poetry, Monk on a Hill, was published by Speaking Tiger 10 years later in 2017. His poems have appeared in national and international journals such as, such as Chandrabhaga, Sangam, Lyric, and L.A. Lit, and also have been included in contemporary English poetry by Indians' Best Asian Poetry, A Poem a Day, and other anthologies. He is a self-employed entrepreneur who has, for the past two decades, convened a group of creative writers in his hometown. He is also a member of the Northeast Writers Forum, a literary journal produced in the Northeast of India. His participation is supported by a grant from the Bureau of Cult Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Our final reader is Brenda Navarro. Brenda Navarro is a writer, literary program coordinator, reporter, and editor. Her first novel, Casas Vacias, was awarded the XL11 Primo, Tigre One, and has been published in 11 languages. Her second novel, Cesnia en la Boca, won the Calamo Prize for Best Book of the Year the prize for best book of the year in the fiction category awarded by the Asociación de Librerías de la Madrid 
in Todos los Libros Prize for Best Fiction Book, all in 2022. It was also a finalist for the 2023 Vargas Llosa Novel Prize. She has contributed writing to media outlets, including El País, London Magazine, Picara Magazine, and Tierra Adentro. Her participation is courtesy of the Embassy of Spain in Washington, D.C., and a gift from the, the estate of W.B. Corton. Without further ado, let's hear from Mr. Artur. Yeah, so I start, we start from a very short video, two minutes and a half. Um, it is an animation prepared by, produced by Al Jazeera TV with the broken English of Zygmunt Bauman that was mentioned in, my intro, in the introduction of, of my work. Polish Jewish sociologist and philosopher. And later I will tell about him a little bit more. Please. These people who are uh, coming now are refugees, not from people hungry without bread and water. People who yesterday were proud of their homes, were proud of their position in society, were very often very well educated, very well off, and so on. But they are refugees now, and they come here. And whom they meet here? The precariat. Precariat lives by anxiety, by fear. We have nightmares. I have a very nice social position. I would like to stick to it. I would like to continue. Precariat comes from the French uh, word precarité, and precarité in loose translation means walking or moving shadows. And now come those people from Syria and Libya. They bring the threats from faraway countries here at our backyard. They suddenly appear next to us. We can't omit their presence. And they signalize, they embody all our fears. Yesterday, they were very powerful men in their country, very happy men. Like we are here today. But look what's happened today. They are homeless. They have without the means of existence. I think that uh, uh, the shock is only beginning. There is no shortcut solution instant solution. So we have to brace ourselves. The very difficult time coming. This last year wave of immigration was not the last one. There are more and more people waiting for do just that. So uh, we have to accept this is the situation. Let us come together and find a solution. Okay. Um, <coughs> Ghirardelli chocolate sorry, sorry. chips. Sorry. <laughs> um, just uh, one remark that Zygmunt Bauman, he himself was a war refugee as a teenager, and later, uh, after the anti-Semitic campaign in Poland in 1968, he was a <coughs> political exile. Uh, so he is speaking not, not only as sociologist and philosopher, but also out of his own um, experience. And I just want to mention that this, uh, this talk referred to the wave of refugees and migrants in 2015. So that's to be precise. So Zygmunt Bauman called refugees harbingers of bad news. And he borrowed this term from the German... Yeah. He borrowed this term from the German playwright Bertolt Brecht. Refugees, migrants, those who arrive from wretched places remind us, we who are lured by prosperity and tranquility of the frailty of existence and the ephemerality of a comfortable life. They are living proof that our lives can fall apart in a single moment because of forces 
over which we have no influence. Climate change, military conflict, shocks to the global financial system, and others. And what do we do to these bearers of bad news? Formerly, they were killed. Today, they are not allowed in on the assumption that they could deliver news that we do not want to hear. Refugee versus migrant, I do, not, I do not like this distinction. According to this differentiation, refugees of war can be sometimes helped while economic migrants are thrown to hell. It is a political construct and an excuse usually for the purpose of not granting entrance. It is like shoving people off of a raft and telling them, drone, there is nothing we can do. In the best case, it is an excuse to take the least amount of responsibility possible and to wash our hands of the matter. Who are they, for example, citizens of Honduras, El Salvador, or Guatemala, who flee the terrors of gangs that rule over city streets? Are these migrants or refugees? And the Mexicans who make their way into the United States because of the terms of NAFTA, a treaty of free trade, that deprived them of the means to support themselves. Or those who flee from cartels, kidnappers, and extortionists. And the, for example, Somalians, some of whom are fleeing drought and hunger, also, or maybe first of all, because of the exploitation and rivalry of the local and global superpowers governing their lives. Are these refugees or economic migrants, or maybe simply despairing human beings who want a tiny bit of safety and hope for a better life? Opening hearts and minds to those arriving from other parts of the world that have been touched by war, misery, and other plagues apparently seems difficult for Europeans and the North Americans. A lot of excuses are undertaken in order to say no to them. How should we think about this? Well, when the natural instinct of solidarity fails, and it clearly does fail, arguments in favor of opening one's arms to people afflicted by misfortune can be sought in various currents of schools or schools of thought. For example, liberals should be able to find arguments in the work of John Rawls. We have the duty to help strangers in the name of the idea of the autonomy of the individual. That is, after all, the foundation of Western democracy. Those who arrive from the South, even if they are not refugees fleeing war, but only people living in conditions of extreme poverty, are not able to make autonomous decisions. Let us then assist them in recovering their independent autonomy. That is, let us be hospitable, let us help. For another example, critics of globalization, referring to the principle of justice, could observe that the world is a system of linked vessels and our privilege comes at the cost of exploitation, harm to people from the periphery. We enjoy prosperity because in the age of outsourcing labor power, for example, someone else is working in, con in conditions of slavery or half, or half slavery. Because we have created such a system, us, not them, and we benefit from it, we should share the gains and partake in the injuries. As those with privilege, we have greater responsibilities than migrants who have been disherited of many goods and rights. For it, another example. Christians should remind themselves of the Good Samaritan. In principle, that alone should be enough. After the hecatomb of the Second World War, the German philosopher Karl Jaspers distinguished between political, moral, and metaphysical guilt. We experience political and moral guilt when our actions or their consequences are the cause of misfortune. But metaphysical guilt is not connected to action. It occurs only when someone else is suffering. And as a members of the same species, we are bound to look after our own and each other's humanity. Building on the thinking, on, on the thinking of Jaspers, Sigmund Bauman writes that in the age of globalization, the difference between these 
two, three guilds has been erased. Quote, on a crowded planet full of the brim, where there's nowhere to hide, we are condemned to being neighbors. We are dependent on each other, whether we know this or not, whether we want to be or not. But people in Europe, for example, in my own country, Poland, cannot say that they bear no responsibility for the fate of the refugees. Poland took part in the American or Western wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And those wars are one of the factors that led to the wave of migrations of, re of recent years. Companies with Polish funding take part in the exploitation of, peoples in, of people in countries of the South, for example, Bangladesh. These circumstances place us among the guilty, morally speaking. So why then should refugees or migrants be grateful? There is an undeniable power in, to the argument of Kamel Daoud, a writer from Algeria, author of the novel The Mersault Investigation. This is a novel in dialogue with The Stranger by Albert Camus, kind of polemic. Quote, we need a new definition of the, founding, of the foundation of our humanity. We do not need today a European or a Western humanism, but, the univer but a universal one. End of quote. If we are people, there's only one answer. We must move over and to make space for refugees or migrants. Again, should they be grateful? They might be grateful on an individual level. But when we think about the political and universal solution, gratitude is not an adequate term. A space under a shared sky on a shared planet is, or in any case should be, a natural right. How are we to manage the massive wave of incoming people? How to make room for them? This is a complicated administrative and economic task. We will not find sensible ideas for bringing it about, however, if we do not first change our way of thinking. And it is better for us to start shifting our me mental furniture now, already. As the American historian Timothy Snyder war warns us in Blacklands, a genocide on the scale of the Holocaust could happen again. Climate change, new waves of migrants, depletion of sources of water, the race for raw materials, and the competition for dominance can create the circumstances for mass atrocities and new mass murder. Quote, we want genocide to have begun and ended with Nazism. That is what is more, most comforting, wrote Swedish author, reporter, and novelist Sven, Sven Linkvist in the book Exterminate All the Brutes, about the crimes of colonialism, which were on the same scale as those of Hitler, but which took place before Hitler. That book describes, among other things, the pervasive atmosphere of the European milieu saturated with a sense of superiority and contempt for the other as the air that Hitler breathed. Today, disturbingly, this atmosphere is returning. We know from the history that there are no exceptionally evil nations, societies, or groups that are uniquely capable of committing mass murder. It is more likely that in particular circumstances, even nations, collective group is capable, every nation, collective group is capable of murder. This should be remembered today when we hear even more frequently refugees or migrants from the South, people of different regions of color or skin are described in terms that echo the language of Nazis. According to Sigmund Bauman, to end my speech, one of the most important lessons of the Holocaust is not that we could become the victim, victims of a new mass murder extermination, but that we could allow it to take place, that is, be its perpetrators. The sooner we take this warning under consideration, the better chance to avoid a future tragedy. Thank you. I'm leaving uh, below the poem by Wisława Szymborska, a Polish novel about refugees, but I, I hope you can enjoy it by ourselves reading it. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. 
Um, thank you, Arthur. Last week we had uh, three people in tuxedos here. Yeah? I feel like a pair of brown shoes, and we have two more people in tuxedos. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm going to read um, a very subjective uh, my paper today. Romario, the illegal immigrant, retires for the day. He takes me to a shack and says, this is my home. I notice he has few possessions. On one wall are framed photographs of his family. He points out some members who are missing, like fingers from his hand. When I ask how, he offers a sigh, knocked down by the treacherous journey on train roofs, the killer desert, and many dark rivers along the border. Others are dead in a forgotten country, drowned in the faded blue margins of a map a million years ago. In the autumn of 2016, I was on the Bourbon Trail of Kentucky. This was during the political rise of Donald Trump. The atmosphere was vitiated by fear, distrust, and prejudice, largely against the Mexicans and Muslims. The political novice had broken all rules of political engagement, yet he remained the front runner of the Republican Party, as he continues to be even today, despite an insurrection and many indictments. But what is a migrant? Who is he? Or are we using the word interchangeably with immigrant and refugee? Strictly speaking, migration is a seasonal event, and a migrant returns to his or home base for some period of the year. In large countries like the US, China, and India, migrants don't need to cross borders. Migrants, in fact, fulfill a certain economic function in agriculture and horticulture, sectors like those found in California. Perhaps it's the farm owners who ought to be grateful. However, if we are using the words migrant and immigrant, legal or illegal, interchangeably, we are confronted by many moral, ethical, economic, and political challenges. As regards refugees, the matter is already in a state of crisis, and help required is urgent, desperate, a matter of life and death. In the poem Home by Washington Shire, um, British uh, Somalian uh, poet, it is evident that no one wants to leave their homeland unless they have to. She writes, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. It is not as if people didn't have a life of their own with their family and friends doing ordinary things, important things, or fun things before they were chased out of their homes in a smash-and-grab action. Let me read you a stanza from a poem, Gompotashi's Sorrow. Yesterday, there were ordinary people living ordinary lives beyond these mountain ranges. Today, they live in an alien land with refugee written all over their faces, eking out a living, building roads in another country. Gods have no answers to their plight and he puts the children to sleep with lies. I reference here the plight of Tibetan refugees following the brutal occupation of Tibet in the early 1960s, and which continues to the present day, who were employed by the Indian government as road construction laborers in the high Himalayas. The biggest regret of the character Tashi Gompo is that every day for over 60 years, he yearns to return to his village in Tibet as a free man, but is unable to fulfill his dream. Should Gompotashi be grateful to India and Indians living as he does in a refugee camp? I'm sure he is grateful in his heart, does, but does he need to wear a headband that says, I am grateful? <coughs> does Romario, who has entered the United States illegally, need to be both grateful and elusive, even as he slogs like a dog, for the basic necessities of life. 
This is a loaded question with a different answer, depending on which side of the border you are on. Can an immigrant enjoy and express the full range of human emotions, or is he or she to be faulted every time for lack of gratitude? In the search for a better life built, is, is the search for a better life built into the human DNA? Does the desire to provide for his kith and kin surpass the narrow confines of political borders, ideology, and faith? What propelled the long trek of mankind more than 70,000 years ago from the shores of Africa to every corner of the habitable earth? Was it abundance of the wild game or the innovation of agriculture that demanded ideal ecosystems or the desertification brought on by a sudden climate change, or just the need of early homo sapiens to explore new pastures? When did political borders and separate identities arise to fence ourselves with narrow walls into different tribes? As we march towards the second quarter of the 21st century, we observe the unstoppable locomotion of people goods and services across the globe, mass migration of people is not only inevitable, but a reality and necessity. We are far more interconnected than we allow ourselves to believe. As the world shrinks further, we realize we are not only interconnected, but also interdependent. Some of us may be familiar with the ancient African concept of Ubuntu, which means I am what I am because of who we all are. It brings us back to the reality of interdependence as it aims to foster a sense of humanity and compassion towards others. In the grand scheme of the cosmos, our Earth remains a very insignificant planet, but it is the only one we know. Our prejudice, fears, selfishness, Mistrust in our little world seem ever more petty and irrelevant when we consider carefully their positive alternatives. Let me end here with a quote from Carl Sagan, who was inspired by an image taken from Voyager 1 in 1990 as it crossed the fringes of the solar system. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, Everything is a narrative. Everything is a narrative. Humanity exists as it is now because we began to invent the stories of who we could be and decided to keep testimony of it. I like literature because in the broad and philosophical sense of time, it knows no borders. So its diverse expressions are infinite and infinite. There is not impossible path, path for language. Language is the path itself, and it bifurcates everywhere. Ergo, literature does not migrate. It is part of the conception we had built of humanity. Frontiers begin when we do not have the words to narrate a problem, or when we forbid words from being used to find answers. Everything is narrative, and in the present time, we have been led to believe that there are not enough words to narrate our situation and formulate questions. It's a lie. For example, in Mexico, in 1994, 
the Zapatista, the Zapatista movement showed us how many contradictions the country was hiding as it tried to give an economically strong international image because the government wanted to be part of the free trade agreement with the United States and Canada. Unfortunately, as we will see over the years, commercial doors will be opened, and at the same time, the border conflicts we are living today we are built. This example is contradictory metaphor of the current 21st century. People cannot move freely around the world, despite the existence of international conventions and protocols that protect this right. But weapons had managed to cross all borders with fragging ease. According to report from international organizations, the countries with the largest arms and defense budgets would be the United States, which also is a home to the five largest arms manufacturers in the world followed by China, Russia, India, and Saudi Arabia. However, we cannot forget that Europe doesn't have to spend as much money on arms because the US does it for them. That's why NATO exists. No one's hands are clean. The so-called first war provide the weapons and our societies provide the debt. The narrative is that many of these highly militarized countries also have a big problem with migration. However, reality tells us that in Europe, people not authorized to cross borders, including asylum seekers pending the resolution of their cases, represent just 1% of the total population of the European continent. What are the interests behind investing so much in armed conflicts and migratory control as border are more. Maybe it sends to, to clear message. One, that societies had to be on national security, us, and that the pornography of misery that they provoke in people who leave their countries, them, is the punishment for not obeying the mandate that one should not migrate when one is poor or when one life is in danger. People are the human side when they are called migrants with a derogatory connotation of the other. And for every message and use of language that supports borders, there is a business or corporate lobbies that receive public money from most governments. The concept of migrants is a business. But let's go back to literature. In 2017, the Iranian writer Dina Najeri wrote in The Guardian about her experience as a refugee girl the bullying she endured for being Iranian and the violence she was subjected to by, subjected to by her classmates at school to the point that her injuries required hospitalization. In Spain, between, between 2022 and 2023, a nine-year-old Colombian girl, two girls of Russian origin, and two other Argentinian girls threw themselves from the balconies of their apartments because they suffered xenophobic, xenophobic bullying at the school. Dina Nayeri explains that when she arrived in America and tried to explain to her teacher that only a few months before she had lived with refugees outside Rome and that most of the social, and the most of the social studies were buffered her, the teacher looked at her sleepily and say, oh, sweetie, you must be so grateful to be here. Grateful, that was the word. Nigeri continues. But what America did, she said, was a basic human obligation. It is the obligation of every person born in a safer room to open the door when someone in danger knocks. It is your duty to answer us, even if we don't give you sugary success stories. Even if we remain a bunch of ordinary Iranians, sometimes bitter or confused. I close the quote. If migrants have the obligation to feel grateful for offering the best of ourselves, for creating networks and knowledge, for paying our taxes, for making cultural and social life, for enriching the place where we arrive, what kind of narrative of humanity are we allowing? In 1994, the Mexican indigenous communities, 
by the way, always considerated foreigners, launched a question that I take up again in the head of this table. If we are not grateful migrants, it is that we have to ask forgiveness for not being grateful? Who has to ask forgiveness and who can grant it? Those who for years and years sat at a full table and were sat and were satiated while with us sat dead so daily, so hours, that we ended up ceasing to be afraid of it. Everything is narrative. That from literature we can continue to create and perhaps it is time to question the lies that have been passed off as a reality. It is not the borders that kill, but the people who allow the free circulation of weapons. And to be clear, Borders are a narrative that we must eliminate, especially if it means questioning nation states. Language is powerful, very powerful, and we must be critical when using it to ask questions. Almost all of us have questions. It is time to dare to demand answers. Thank you, everyone, and thanks to Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. You, you created um, a literal segue for us about questions and answers, right? So while you all gather your thoughts, um, which, I, which I hope you all have many after those readings, I want to share just some events that we have coming up um, at the IWP. Uh, later today at 5 o'clock, you can join us for our penultimate event at the Shamba House. It's our reading series. You'll hear from Ajarim Taji, who is from Kazakhstan, and Nektaria Anastasiadu, who is from Turkey and Greece. Light refreshments will be served. Um, again, here next Friday in the same space at noon, we'll have another discussion. Uh, we'll have Eva Wong, we'll have Marcela Guerrero, and Noel de Jesus speaking on the theme of writing love in the age of irony. Uh, there will be no IWP events this Sunday, the 22nd, because we are going to New York. So if you need us, that's where we'll be. Um, so please, if you have any questions, raise your hand, and Ida here will be assisting with the microphone. It's important that you wait for the microphone to get to you so the folks at home on the live stream will be able to hear you. Um, and other than that, I will open it up to questions and Ida. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I did enjoy the, the the readings. I just wanted to ask uh, one question. Uh, for example, I think you have all pointed out uh, um, how you have defined, for example, in your work, uh, a migrant. You can see that it's almost in the same light. But Guru, you went a step further to, you know, interrogate who a migrant is. So it seems like this word migrant has taken up certain negative connotations, you know, of depravity poverty, you know, precarity, and refugeehood. But as you rightly point out, that uh, migration is just an act of movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, border crossing, whether, you know, conceptual or physical borders, but it's migration. So, for example, I'll give an example that um, we have people in Africa or in Malawi, for example, who have migrated from Canada or you, the USA in search of better lives. Because, say, somebody who has $100,000 to his name here in America, that person just an ordinary person. When they take that $100,000 and they go to Malawi and they invest it in uh, tourism, they can make much more money and live a way better life than they can live here because of the power of the dollar in our economy. <coughs> so this person is a migrant in my, you know, uh, the way I see the word. But in, you know, these dominant definitions of these words, do, do, is this person considered a migrant? And should they be grateful? Or is the word migrant only reduced to people from certain populations and from certain parts of the world and not from people, uh, parts like America? So when we talk about a migrant, what are we talking about? I just wanted to, to find out from you. Um, 
Wesley, I, I'm not as erudite as you last week. You gave a very erudite paper here. Uh, I had one passage, I think, that's been deleted from here. Um, you know, today uh, you have the digital nomads. You know, are they migrants? They're sitting in a, a lazy boy chair or they're in their bed and, you know. And but they, because we're so interconnected that you can do work from any part of the world uh, and they're forever traveling, it seems, you know, or they're just stationary. So uh, as the world is far more, it gets more and more integrated and opportunities, um, you know, where opportunities lie, people go there, whether you are a digital nomad or where you are as an investor, as an entrepreneur, you go to uh, shores other than yours. Um, you know, people, uh, because if you look at, uh, the history, uh, uh, because Europe had a craving for sugar, <laughs> that's why they colonized in you know, a lot parts of the uh, world. You know, I mean, they came to India, and uh, and and other colonies from Cuba to all these were sugar plantations. So, and these people were not going; they were also going to India for a better opportunity. You know, because they could, like you said, these people who have made hundred uh, hundred thousand dollars is an average person here. But in Malawi or even in India, he's pretty pretty rich. And today, because we become more and more global, you know, you can take your capital anywhere and invest it. And you know, you can. Uh, I mean, of course, he would be termed migrant, and he should be grateful to the country that he's from which he earns his bread and butter, I guess, in, a, in that way. But in the larger context of uh, when we're talking about uh, what we've been presenting, because most of these migrants coming to a first world country have come from a very difficult uh, uh, situation back home. And, you know, like uh, Arthur said, in, you know, where does he run when you have, uh, you know, where gangs are ruling uh, the, you know, overtaking the levers of the state? And you have nothing but to go and find sanctuary in a in a in a in a place that can give you that little bit of uh, uh, you know safety of life for your kids and kin. I can add something to it. Uh, in a plain description, migrant is somebody who is moving, and uh, for whatever reason. But frankly, we are not talking about this. We are talking about rather. The word migrant is loaded with very different meanings, with politics, with ideology, with prejudices. So we are not talking just about somebody who is moving. I can have a um, fantasy to move to Spain and live at the sea. And I, am I migrant? Yes, but we are not talking about this situation. We're talking about the situation where people uh, migrate from the uh, impoverished places, usually because our world is divided on center and periphery, or the privileged and un uh, underprivileged, or non-privileged, or exploited. So uh, I don't know the case of somebody from Malawi who traveled somewhere and earned $100,000, but I'm talking rather about mm, people I met uh, in the Greek uh, island of Kos uh, in 2015, and they were coming from Bangladesh. And we're talking about how they are exploited there. And then I realized that, uh, I, I don't remember, maybe at the time I didn't know that. Maybe th there was a huge accident in the, one of the factories in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and, the, and the company uh, that ran this, this place was a company with Polish capital. So this, uh, like, uh, make me start to think, OK, are we responsible? Yes, I mean, not. Uh, me personally, but we as a Polish society or, or a Polish business world or we uh, privileged world. So I think that we are talking about this. And uh, this differentiation is usually made by the, policy, by the policy makers who do not want people uh, to enter. Uh, so it is much more difficult to refuse entrance for somebody who is defined by international law as refugee, and uh, it is much more difficult, and usually uh, it is played very well by the politicians uh, to 
to give somebody brand, uh, you are only migrant. So we will we'll think it over if we let you in or not. And I was asking this question because in, I, would, I would say that in the most of the cases, we can't really dif well differentiate or put the border between refugee and migrant because in many cases, this all uh, situations are mixed. So for example, the people from Central America, from Mexico, who are traveling to the United States, uh, they usually are called economic migrants. But when somebody is escaping the uh, drug cartels or gangs on the streets, or the rules that was imposed by the United States and Canada on Mexico, for example, the rules of uh, free trade, uh, these people lost their um, sources of uh, source of so, to sustain themselves, yes? Uh, so it is, uh, it is so difficult to, to make this, dif uh, to, to put the differ difference between two terms. And uh, in my opinion, it is, um, it's a lot of uh, political game in it. And uh, that's why we should rather tend to open, to change laws, to, uh, to open borders, to, of course, I know, administrative uh, effort, of, of course, everything, uh, not just spontaneously, but, uh, but to create the conditions in which people from the unprivileged part of the world can participate in our prosperity. Uh, well, I just want to say uh, a little words. Uh, when I am talking about the, the, the language is powerful is because I really believe that the words ha have a lot of power. When we pronounce them, when we are thinking about concepts, we put a lot of ideas uh, in, in that words. And for me right now, migrant, it's a concept that is just a label for, for, for the market and for the, the their power relationships between your political situations. And I, I am guessing, I am trying to, to be a kind of person that is against about that concept because for me, migrant is when we are talking about nationaliz nationalisms, and when we are talking about nationalisms, we are ended always in fascists. And for me, uh, the other and fascists is uh, this tiny and tiny um, lines between to to put in one hand who are a person and who are not a person and for me when we are talking about migrant in this context it's like a, they don't deserve to be a person and for me that's the big problem with that word right now hi uh, hi thank you all of you i want to go back to answer maybe or to comment on Wesley's question by going back to uh, to Brenda's paper, which is, again, we're talking about the narrative and the power of the narrative. So I think anyone can, can be a migrant, but then we can see how the narrative that has been shaping our collective memory about who is a migrant is the migrant who's coming from underprivileged situation, then we recognize them as migrants and we, we talk about them and we want to save them and we want to grant them prosperity or tranquility or we want them to aspire like the lives that we have. And we tend sometimes to forget that those people, it's, it's not just a problem of, of, of their personal circumstances, that it is something that has to do with with the global north that is usually the ones are uh, enjoying the prosperity of the world. And it's so difficult for so many people to recognize this and to see this and to acknowledge that what I am enjoying in this place has nothing to do only with me and with how smart I am or how privileged I am in this place. It has to do with how many people, other people in other places were exploited. And back to Wesley's, is the one who is going from the US to Malawi a migrant? Yes, he is a migrant and he is going to a better life because what will 100,000 do for a person in the United States? So he's going for a better life in Malawi where he can live a, a privileged life. But then again, he, he doesn't have to challenge the borders because it's easy for a US citizen to go anywhere in the world. 
But if someone from Malawi wants to go to the US, then it's a different story. And that's, that's the narrative that is shaping our, our, our mentality somehow and our, our collective thinking that, uh, okay, he is a migrant because he is coming from the bottom to the top. And this is also another thing that we have to think. What is top and what is bottom? What is north and what is south? And who shaped all these narratives for us to think in this way, that this place is better than the other, or those people are enjoying a better life than, the, than, than other people? Because it's not only about mat mater materialism. There are so many people enjoying their lives with, with the less that they have. But then, again, the exploitation of the north for the south global makes this, this uh, interchangeable um, challenges. And then we have to face the narrative, and then we have to face the, uh, the other kind of violences that we don't want to, to just like look at them on the face. And we know, OK, this is what we should talk about. We should talk about colonialism, imperialism. We should talk about genocides. We should talk about so many things that are happening now. And instead, we ask, should the refugee or the migrant be grateful? And this is, again, we turn the whole thing, and we talk about the things that make us comfortable, and we don't think, think or talk about the things that will make us uncomfortable. Thank you. Does anybody want to say something to that? Oh, I agree. <laughs> I, I want to thank Salva for that because I've been thinking about it. In Nigeria, you have a lot of Chinese, Lebanese, Indians, I mean a lot. And they are making millions. They're making a killing in that country. And yes, that country is very rich. So the question would be, and I want to take it from where she's going, how grateful should they be? And what forms of gratitude should we see from them? Because they are making a killing. Now, my question is reversed. Shall, should the receiving countries be grateful? Because we all know the disparities and the challenges some of the first world countries are facing with the birth rates and all. And the second part of the question is, have they, has there been any consistency in receiving migrants? Or it is whenever they need, they open the gates and then something else happens. Uh, well, in Spanish, I am talking about this for two hours because it's really my, my subject. Uh, I, I guess you have the answer. Uh, I guess the, the countries who received uh, other people need to be so grateful because the people who are in other space where they are not born, they bring with them a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, a lot of other kind of food or ways to see, to see, to 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 live in the world, and that it's wonderful. I I I I am, don't I don't understand why we need to to think about borders, because borders, as I said, it's, it's just a narrative. And when we are talking about this narrative, is we are talking about nation states. And I am a little radical here, but for me, the question is, why are we still thinking about nation states when we, are, when we have a lot of knowledge that doesn't help us as a humanity? Okay, just uh, just one uh, on the remark, but because I, I was feeling that the very question uh, of this panel has been somehow undermined, and it's uh, of course uh, it's the right thing to do, uh, but um, since we, like, I mean, the, this is a huge huge problem on the catalog of of problems issues. Um, we could also we could, for example, start this conversation, but there is. Uh, uh, to challenge it, to, 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 to talk about the uh, economic uh, structure of uh, globalized world uh, and uh, where the money goes and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this would be a completely different angle uh, for talking about the, the wave of mi migrations. But uh, I mean, since 
since we bought this question, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, I think, I know, I think it's leg absolutely legitimate. It's absolutely legitimate, and I think that we somehow challenged this, and um, I don't know. Uh, coming back to Ali, <clears throat> and I mean, um, yeah, the other day we were at Shambhog House, and this is, we met a lady who talked about the meat packers uh, in, in the rural Iowa. And if you didn't have them, many of us wouldn't be having our lunches and dinners. But also uh, looking at, you know, Ali comes from Dubai, very prosperous state. Uh, but then you have a whole lot of migrants uh, there uh, working uh, because there's job opportunities. Now, it is a very complex thing because um, I come from northeast part of India, and there, was a, there, is, there is a state called Tripura. And it was uh, before uh, the partition of India, it was uh, predominantly uh, uh, a tribal state. And uh, then after the partition of India, when India was broken into uh, Pakistan, East Pakistan, West Pakistan, and the I India, a whole lot of people um, of, um, who were Hindus crossed over the border to Tripura. And the population was so kind of, uh, you know, where initially there were just 20% or less than that uh, Bengali population became 70% Bengali population. Today they control the levers of power, the politics, everything. And therefore there has been a long insurgency going on. So that is also one complexity, you know. And, uh, but as uh, Brenda said, in Europe, there's nothing to fear. It's not even 1%. You know? exactly. It's not even 1%. So, you know, we have to have a very nuanced and very kind of, uh, I mean, I would, the very, uh, the thing I ended with was Carl Sagan because in the end, we are that little mote of dust suspended in a, a beam of uh, light. So we, this is the only home we know and how we uh, help each other, how compassion and, uh, you know, um, because we are in, a, in a, even a further, you know, globalized world, we are basically uh, gaining from each other, whether it's labor or whether it's knowledge or whether it's capital, whatever it is. And how best we go forward is for us to, I guess, you know, figure out as we, as, as, as we as a human civilization go forward. So that's it. So we have time for one more quick question. Um, I just wanted to, as we were talking, I, I just thought about, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about dehumanization, and it seems like one of the things that humanizes uh, the situation for us is the arts, literature, and uh, maybe if each of you could maybe mention one book or something that you think is a good example of that humanization through literature of someone, of a group that might be considered the other in different circumstances. I, I, I believe yes, but the big problem here is that uh, for example, in the United States, uh, you only translate uh, 5% uh, of other countries. So it, uh, we don't have this kind of uh, equilibrium. I don't mm -hmm. remember the word. But this balance, uh, so uh, how, con how could be uh, people, human being for, for you when you are not interested in, in our, in our well, living? Yeah, exactly. I was just wondering if you can, yeah. if you have had that experience. You can, I, I think of uh, Americana is a book I, I, I think of Americana as a book I read a few years ago, which, you know, opened me to the better understanding of Nigeria and and uh, what it would be like to come from there. Uh, certainly, America is. Uh, I mean, you America is a it's a contradiction in and also you know it's uh, for me. To a lot of people, I mean, it is uh, the home they'll be able to make. They will become prosperous. It is a land of opportunities. 
but then uh, America has this unique um, uh, cultural uh, thing where it is the melting pot. You know, I mean, in America, anybody could aspire if you had the opportunity. But of course, there are prejudices, there are systemic uh, um, uh, guards, uh, guardrails where an, a person coming from the third world or the south, global south find it much more difficult uh, as opposed to, say, a person coming from Europe or Japan or, you know. So, uh, but having said that, yes, America has been in a, uh, as we, we have to acknowledge that it has provided shelter and it has provided uh, sanctuary to many of people fleeing their countries for whatever reason. You know, whether it's uh, war or prosecution or political asylum or, uh, uh, you know, um, of uh, uh, sexual, uh, what do you call it, apartheid, like in many African countries. Uh, so, you know, so, I mean, yes. So, so I just, so, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not going to point out any book. I would feel a bit strange to point out like one book that humanizes, but I would like to add something to what Guru said that, uh, that yes, uh, America is receiving people from uh, parts of the world uh, that are um, unprivileged, but at the same time, I, I would say that America is doing a lot of destruction in the world uh, that uh, later, um, the fruit of it is their migration and wave of refugees. So just I didn't want to, to leave this last phrase of Guru like without any comment. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Right. Um, can I just say that I, I think the gentleman meant Americana, but yeah, I know, I know, but I didn't refer to to the to the very question. But Guru, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a you know, libraries are full of of books that you can, you can find. I, yeah, America is a contradiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, it's very. Um, complex ending for a very complex topic and I want to thank Brenda and Gura and Arta for your wonderful presentations. Um, Shelley has been called away to a, 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 an appointment so I want to take the opportunity to thank you all for coming and do thank think you. of coming next week to a very interesting panel on love and irony. Thank you.